Hello, everyone. Welcome to the May 2014 Professor Messer A Plus Study Group. We got it in right at the end of May, didn't we? It's May the 31st of 2014. I managed to take the entire month and not do a study group. And then at the very end, we snuck one in there. So it was uh, something that everybody was wondering, when are we doing the study group? When is that happening? So finally, I was able to get that on the calendar and make sure that everybody could attend that study group. We do this study group every month. It's one of these things that allows me to, to, to take advantage of all of the questions you send me, and I just compile them up, and then I spit them right back at a, out at you. Uh, I do this study group, and it's sponsored really by you. I couldn't do this study group if you weren't watching my free YouTube videos. Every single one of my A-plus videos is available to watch absolutely free out on professormesser.com. You can also go to freeaplus.com, freeaplus.com. It'll take you right to the entire index of A-plus videos. I also um, have people that will purchase offline versions of this. That also helps keep the website running. You can find out more about that at professormesser.com. Uh, I also want to make sure that you're aware that we have other links to keep track of what's going on here as well. There's professormesser.com slash Twitter slash Facebook slash YouTube. And here's a good one if you want to save some money is slash vouchers. I think that's one of the things that a lot of people want to be able to save just a little bit of money. You can use those vouchers to save money across any of the CompTIA certifications that you might take. So it doesn't have to be A+. plus. It could be Network+. plus. It could be Security+, plus as well. This is a live call-in study group, so I take your calls. One of the things that we're going to do this time is I have a lot more questions for you. So when you call in, first thing I'm going to do is ask you to answer a question. So we're all together going to do some pop quizzes today. I have a lot of them available and trying to get that that going as well. There is also the case where you may already have your A-plus certification and you may want to learn more about maintaining that certification. You can use this study group as one of the things that can apply towards your continuing education credits. And those continuing education units are all found also at the CompTIA website at comptia.org. There's also a nice big URL that I put up here that can also take you to the certification details. There's a lot of different things you can do, a lot of different things you ultimately have to do to maintain your certification. This is one of those things. I think most people will probably take and the next higher layer certification, since that's free to do and most people are doing that anyway. And that also renews your lower level certifications. You can find out all about that at the CompTIA website at comptia.org. As I mentioned, uh, I couldn't do this study group if you weren't sponsoring what we did here. All of my videos are available to watch free or to watch and take offline as well. You can uh, have a look at purchasing those at professormesser.com slash downloadable dash A plus. It's one of the things that you can do. You can also notice online, even on my website, I have uh, transcripts of everything. I took all the videos. I sent them off to nice people who typed in every word that I said. And they actually had the videos. So they were able to do a really good job, very accurate job with those transcripts. And I put the transcripts as part of the YouTube video. So if you have closed captioning turned on, you'll see my transcripts, not the weird YouTube tried to figure it out kind of transcript, which with this kind of technology doesn't exactly work exactly well. So I put my transcripts on YouTube. And also on my website, when you're watching a video, if you scroll down, you'll see the entire transcript there as well. So there's some nice things to, to work along and get those things going too. Now, I mentioned earlier that I'm going to be asking you a lot of questions today. And one of the things that um, that I have is some an online system that we can use that you can grab your mobile device, open up another window in your browser, and go to a website called govote.at, and it will ask for a number. And that number, in this particular case, I'm going to ask you a question about how long you've been studying for your A-plus certification. And if you go to govote.at, and you go to 998735, that's the magic number, or grab a QR code reader and just scan your screen right now on that QR code. It should take you directly to that. I'm looking at the QR code. If you look at the website itself, in fact, I'll flip over there, you'll see people will start voting on that immediately, which is kind of nice. Here's the the site itself. So now you see the QR code up there and behind the scenes, we'll see everyone start voting on how long they've been taking their or studying for their, their A plus certification. 
one of the things that we like to do in the study group is get an idea of that so we know how to position some of the questions and other things that we'll be going through. In this study group, I'm going to be doing a lot more questions to you. So think of it as a game show where you can call in and get a question correct and win nothing. I have no prizes. There's, there's The prize is that you've, you know that you've done a good job. It's the, the gift of knowledge that you get for calling in. I don't have any, I need to create some tchotchkes or something. You know, you get a free Professor Messer pin or something. It's one of those things that might come in handy later on if you want to be able to, to see uh, what you've been doing with those pieces. That might come in handy. I might think of doing something like that. It could be very useful. One of the things that we're doing on the study group is these questions. You can see behind the scenes. Let's get rid of the QR code. You've had plenty of time to scan that. Get ready for the next one, though, because I have plenty of questions available to you. These QR code questions uh, really do come in handy because you're able to, to snapshot and get into it. And I have a bunch of extra questions set up this time, so we should be able to get to it. So those of you that are going through and looking at the responses. We see we've got a, a good mix here. Some people that are just starting out, we've got one to three months. Some people that have been doing this more than a year, studying more than a year. Some of you already have your A-plus certification. You may have already had it for quite some time. You may be adding that to that list as well. One of the things that, that I, I like to do with these study groups is really mix up the type of information. So whether you have just started the studying process for your A-plus or you're planning later on to add to it or renew it, I'm trying to give you more content that you can use, command line options, things you may have even forgotten about motherboard concepts during the A-plus learning certification. You, when you're learning a, a certification, you're trying to figure it out. Everything is crammed into such a very short time frame. Sometimes nice to go back and look at some of these things that you did for the certification that now you can actually use when you're out in the real world. So that, that does help as well. There's a number of questions that I get every month about the A-plus certification itself. It's one of the things that uh, that I seem to find people are just getting into A-plus and trying to figure out how does this certification work and how is it structured? Uh, should I take both exams at the same time? And if I should, why should I? And here's a good example of one of these things. This is um, uh, the, the 22801. And the 22802. One of the things that with both of these exams is that the topics in the exams are very different now. If you look back at older versions of the A plus exam, there was a lot of overlap between both of those. These days, the overlap has been eliminated. CompTIA really wanted to create standalone exams so that you could study for either one of these and go take that one and you're done with those concepts, at least effectively. There's very, very little overlap between these exams anymore. There used to be substantial, significant overlap. In fact, in the past, a lot of people said, well, you should just study for both of them and take both of them at the same time. That is so much content. It doesn't even make sense to do that any longer. These days, you can study for your 801 and take that one, and then study for your 802, and it's going to be completely different content. So you don't have to cram everything into a single day of testing. I couldn't even imagine trying to do that the first time with the A-plus certification. You can see in the 801, you've got PC hardware, networking, laptops, printers, and operational procedures. A lot of people call this the hardware exam. It's not exactly anymore a hardware exam because there's networking in there. There's operational procedures in there. But a lot of the hardware is indeed found in that 801. You could take the 802 exam first. It doesn't matter what order you take these things in. You just have to be sure you take both of them before they are retired. The 802 exam is more software-oriented, but again, it's not just software. It's operating systems, certainly, but there's also security concepts on it. Mobile devices is a brand new entire section on the 800 series exam. So that's that's not even it's kind of hardware and it's kind of software. It's a mobile device. It's a it's a device unto itself and troubleshooting. That's probably the only section where there's a little bit of things that do overlap where it might be good to know more about the hardware on the 801 so you can apply some of that towards the troubleshooting piece. And I think that's when you get into trying to learn more about the technology and what it's doing. 
So keep that in mind. Notice the scales on this are pretty interesting. People will say, um, is there a, a particular percentage correct that I need to get? Uh, the, the problem or the challenge with trying to calculate that is that we believe every question has a different number of points associated with it. So some questions may be worth very little. Some questions may be worth a lot. And we, we have that idea because, as you can see here, the score on the exams is scaled between 100 and 900. So for the 801, you have to make a 675 in the range of 100 to 900. So there's not even a zero. It starts at 100 and it goes to 900. I know. It's kind of odd. Nobody else does this that way. You, it's usually a percentage correct, but not with these certification exams. They mix it up a little bit. You have to get a 700 on the 802, so you have to do a little bit better on the 802 than you do on the 801 to get a passing grade. Those are things to keep in mind. Uh, when you look at this, you can kind of estimate what a percentage correct might be, but there's no way to sit down at the exam, go through what you've answered, and say, if I miss 10 of these, I'll pass. You can't do that. No, because some of them, you may be a pick. The 10 that you've missed may be the largest percentage or largest number value for this. So picking 10 other questions may actually, and missing those may actually be better off than the 10 you, you're missing. It's, it's a challenge to figure that piece out. The idea is you want to get all of them right. Just go into the exam, get every single one of those correct. And I think that's what we want to be able to do. If you are on the line, we're going to go to some calls, and I'm going to ask you some questions when we pick up these phones. So uh, if you have a question for me, you're just going to have to wait until I ask a question of you. And we're going to have everybody answer these questions. So there's no talking in the chat room about what these questions might be. It's going to be useful for you to be able to answer these on your own. And one thing is the caller is actually going to have a little bit more time because there's about a, a 30 to 45 second delay from the time that we do this until the time that you see it. So if you are on the phone, you want to be listening on the phone. Otherwise, I'll pick up the line and you're 45 seconds behind what we're doing. So with that, let's go to the phone calls. I've got uh, someone from the 661 area code. Are you there, caller? I can hear you, caller, 661 area code. Are you there? Nope. Hello. I hear your background noise. Are you there, caller? Yes. Hi, what's your name? Uh, Henry Ochoa. Hello, Henry. Thanks for calling today. Um, before you ask a question of me, I have a question for you. We're going to mix this up today. So hopefully you're ready sure. to answer a question. Are you ready? I'm putting you on the spot. No problem. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna do one. It's gonna be kind of hard to watch on the live stream, so you're just gonna have to listen to me to answer the question. But if you are on the live stream, you'll be able to see the question and at least see what I'm I'm saying. So the question I have for you is: What type of memory is used to improve the performance of CPU instruction processing? And I have some options for you, so this is not a fill in the blank. So, what type of memory is used to improve the performance of CPU instruction processing? Is it Cache memory, static memory, hybrid memory, or SD RAM memory. So those are your four options. Do you have a, a particular one that you're leaning towards uh, looking or trying to figure out? If you're also, by the way, watching on the live stream and you'd like to vote yourself, go to govote.at and enter the number 11943. I'll also put up the QR code again for those of you that like that QR code. So, Henry, we'll go, go back to you. Any ideas or I thoughts about what type of memory might be improving the performance? When it, what were the first ones? Static. There was first one's cache, static, hybrid, and SD-RAM. So this is when one it, of those questions, it, by the way, that requires that you pick the best answer for this particular yeah. piece. Well, I, I'll try my best. Static. We're going to go with static on that one. I'm going to let people are voting right now. So we're going to let people vote on this. And by the way, it, one good thing about this, by the way, whether you get it right or you get it wrong, you actually win the same thing. I think I mentioned that earlier because I don't have any prizes. Yeah. We're low budget here. I really I need to think about that. Yeah. Create some Professor Messer screwdrivers <laughs> or something like that. The performance of CPU instruction processing, I've hidden the votes online. So as people are voting, we don't actually know what people are, are voting with yet. And again, in the chat room, no talking about what those are. Uh, that's one of those things that uh, 
that is a challenge. I hope to get a stream soon that will be a lot faster, more real time on this. So we have 20 responses. Let's see what people have voted with. And we had 20 people said cache, four people said static, zero said hybrid, and one said SD RAM. So I think in this particular case, I'm going to go with the folks that uh, elected the cache memory. So when you're looking at the CPU and you're looking at level one, layer two, layer three cache, those are the types of memory that improve the instruction processing of the CPU because it puts all of those registers and the information that it needs directly on the CPU chip in memory, and it goes out and tries to grab that information instead of grabbing that information from memory. It's got it right there sitting on the chip. So the good part about it is number one, maybe you didn't get it right, but you did actually learn something, which I always try to see when something breaks. That's when I really learn something. And secondly, you didn't lose anything. Your your dollar value goes back to zero. I'm very sorry, Henry. <laughs> uh-huh. that's, but that's okay, because if you won, your dollar value would have been zero as well. Do you have a question for me today? Well, um, I just graduated from the school. Congratulations. So I took... Yeah, I took a year of uh, uh, re computer repair and maintenance. My diploma just got here a month ago. Excellent. And now I'm going for the A+, plus, the 2.0. I just received my books from school to, to prepare for the A+. Plus. Good. But I'm finding that the wording is getting me a little bit confused. With yeah. the, sorry about that. Sure. Yeah. So the, the wording, you know what I learned in school? The wording changes in the eight plus exam. We are kind of tricky with the wording. Do you have an example of one that really just threw you off a bit? Um, mostly, you know, I. Uh, it's just maybe sometimes they talk about the new stuff. Right. This is like you know, for example, the uh, 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 the new. Bridges, this um, the Sandy Bridge, right? And the Haswell and then, chips, like, the Sandy yeah. Bridge, the um, the, yes. And, and sometimes we it, it, in school we didn't even got to all, all, all we did. Sorry about that. All we did was talk about the South Bridge and North Bridge, right? This is this is probably one of the challenges I see with people when they grab these. When they get their book, their A plus books, and I, I can appreciate what the authors of the A plus books are trying to do, because they want to put as much information into the book as possible, and very often they go outside the scope of the book a bit. Uh, they go well into um, details of chipsets, of CPUs, of operating systems that really don't have any per particular requirement on the A plus certification. Uh, for instance, I have uh, part of my, my CPU uh, exam, my CPU videos for the A plus exam show things about a quad core. I show a quad core CPU. It happens to be a Sandy Bridge processor. And I added that information because I think it's helpful to understand the terms of that. But one of the things that you'll find, if you look at the A plus exam objectives, it doesn't have the word, I don't think it has the word Sandy Bridge anywhere on there. It doesn't have the word Haswell anywhere on the A-plus exam objectives. And so my first recommendation to you is, first, your book probably has a list of the exam objectives, but it might be worthwhile as well to go out to the CompTIA website and download the objectives as well. I also have a quick link to that. If you go to professormesser.com slash objectives, it will take you to the CompTIA website where you can download those objectives and look those over. In fact, those make a really good checklist. And if you run into a part in the book that's talking about some very unusual set of things that you've never seen before and they certainly didn't teach it in your class and now it's got a different name associated with it, look through that list. If it's not on the objective list, don't spend a lot of time worrying about it because CompTIA stays very, very, very close to that list when they make their exams. So if you know everything that's on your objective list, you're going to pass. 
if they even ask for something that's off the objective list, here's here's a little little interesting tidbit for you, is they even tell you before you start the exam, we might ask you something that's not even remotely close to being on the objectives, but we're not going to we're not going to take any points off and you're not going to gain any points. It, it is effectively non-graded question, which that's, that's kind of, that's kind of frustrating. If you're trying to take an exam and you come across a question, you're wondering where in the world did they get this information? For instance, uh, this, this happened in the last exam. Uh, you have, uh, if you look at the exam objectives, windows eight is not currently on CompTIA's exam objectives. But when you take the exam, you might get a Windows 8 question. And that's a good example of a question they might ask you that that has doesn't count for anything and it doesn't count against you on the exam. So as you're reading these books, they like to put a ton of information in there. Don't worry about it so much. Uh, go back to the exam objectives. Uh, sync up with those, and I think you'll be just fine. I have another question, Professor. Sorry to interrupt you. Sure, no. Uh, this is what happened. You know, I went to school and I'm not, it's not an ego. I'm not breaking. I graduated with a 85 mark. Great. My diploma. Good. And now I did, uh, I, I know some things and I did my A plus. I did a, you know, I did just a quiz or a, a normal one through online and I got 60. <laughs> yep. Almost 65, 60. Is that okay or is it because I don't, I'm, I'm lost at, I went through school for one year and a half, and I, I graduated with, like, you know, 75 and, and 85 marks. But now that I'm doing my eight plus, my marks are going down. You have to, you have to wonder what happened. I thought I, I thought I knew knew all this information. Uh, one of the things uh, I ran yeah, into, yeah. I first you took. You can help me on this. He, first, there's a couple of things to consider. First. Um, you have to be very particular about what, where you get your content online, especially if it's a practice exam. There are a huge number of practice, pra practice exams online, and the practice exams are free. Uh, the challenge that I've seen, though, is, is very often these exams are being created by people who mean to do well, but the questions aren't really uh, designed very well. It, it really takes a lot of work. Um, to create a question that goes directly to the objectives and presents answers that are very clear about what you need to to answer for that particular question. And I, I know this because I create a new pop quiz every day, and it's taken years, literally, of creating these pop quizzes to build a question that is that is pointed, that's also challenging, but also has a very clear answer in that answer list. So I, I would recommend that you find a set of sample questions that is very specific to to the exam. And you, it may be a case where you want to buy something. I recommend um, GTS Learning, which is a partner that I have on the Professor Messer website. They have online sample questions you can buy. If you want it in a book, there's a really good book from um, a, called Exam Cram Sample Questions. There's a lot of different Exam Cram books out there, but the one that, that I've seen that's really good is Exam Cram Sample Questions. It's a book of nothing but questions, and they're really well-designed questions that, that you can sit down and take and get a really good understanding of whether you know the content or not. So don't worry so much that this online test that may have even been outdated or not well designed didn't quite hit the mark with what you were trying to do. I think you should probably look around for some better resources. I, I uh, dear process, uh, professor, I do have an exam cram. That's what they sent me from school now. Oh, good. Now and is I'm that the that now. is that the exam cram A plus study book, or it, does it say on the cover exam cram sample questions? Or I think it's sample questions is what they have. Or exam cram. No, somebody it, in the chat it, room it, will correct oh. me. Uh, exam cram six edition two twenty dash eight oh one two twenty dash eight oh two. So that sounds uh, like the thick. Yep, that sounds like the they have two books. They have one that is a a normal study book. The one I'm looking for practice questions. It's called Exam Cram and it has on the front two twenty eight oh one and two twenty eight oh two and it has practice yeah. questions listed on there as well. That's the book I'm referring to that's nothing but questions. And I think you probably need both. You need a good book to study from, but I think it's also good to have a book or some other type of content with questions and answers as well, just as a sanity check. But it really does need to be a high quality question and answer book. Okay, 
And I have another question, Professor. After, like, I really enjoy this. I, I, I really know. Um, I really enjoy doing this for a living. And me too. Um, can you go? You necessarily have to go back to school, or can you take your? I like my networking later and my security certificates. Can you do those on your own? I, I think you can, and I think it's. It's a it's an evolution in IT. When I started with technology, um, I started in college. Well, really, I started before college. I, I learned programming and tried to work on these. Really, really was the very beginning of home computing. Uh, was before IBM PCs. When I was in college, the college had a, a a mainframe and supercomputer center that I was an operator. I was the lowest of lowest grunts. They get students to come in and take the midnight shifts and the weekend shifts. And you effectively take printouts off a printer and plots off a plotter and you mount tapes. It was the most boring of boring jobs, but I thought it was great because there's supercomputers in the room and they're (laughs) liquid nitrogen cooled and you're learning about different ways of computing and you're seeing people do different things. And at the time, I didn't know what I'd want to do. My first job that was outside of college was effectively delivering printer cables and doing memory upgrades and hard drive upgrades on IBM systems. It, again, kind of the tech, the technical technician kind of break fix job. And it just evolves from there. I got an interest in operating systems from there. I got an interest in networking from there. Windows came out. If, if you told me when I was in college that Ultimately, I would have a YouTube channel and I just put videos out on the internet and you'd be I'd be doing things with operating systems and I'd be working with Win- Windows was not even a concept then. Twitter wasn't around 6 years ago. Uh, those types of things just change and you kind of roll with it. It's kind of an evolution. So, whatever you th- whatever you think you're going to be doing now, you will be doing some of it, but it's going to change in 5 years, in 10 years, in 15 years and you have no other choice but to learn as you go, uh, to watch podcasts and listen to podcasts, to uh, grab books, to read articles online. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that today, of things that I'm doing this summer to keep my knowledge going with technology, because I think it's just something that you're, you're going to be doing for the rest of your career. Otherwise, you'll never be able to keep up with what's going on. Um, thank you for that. Very well said. Professor, thank you. Henry, thank you for yeah. calling. It was great for you to call in. Thanks for having fun with us on, on the, the quiz, and uh, hopefully we'll hear from you next time, too. Yeah, thank you, Professor. I learned a lot from you, too. I, that's why I keep you on Facebook. You have helped me quite a bit, and um, what you said, too. I, I keep up. I, I try to find broken computers and just learn as I go. That's a great way to do and, it. And, you know, I learned that if you see one mistake, if they're not called mistakes, it's a process of learning. <laughs> that's right. You don't learn unless it's broken. That's that's my mantra. And that's why I did before. Now I'm like, okay, this is, it was a mistake. And I like, this is how I'm going to learn. Because I changed, uh, I changed uh, for the very first time uh, a screen. Oh, yeah, on I a laptop. It, yes, oh. on a laptop. And, and it worked. And I learned the hard <laughs> lesson. I put it back all together. <laughs> And I learned, it, 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 I learned now not to say it's not a mistake, it's a process learning, that to remember the connection to be connected properly uh-huh. or yes. put at least a tape on the back. You will know very quickly. <laughs> yes. So it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a great learning process. But thank you, uh, Professor, for all the info. And I'll keep on watching you and answering questions because I, I, have, I have a year to... To write the A plus. Henry, thank you uh, for calling. Keep us also updated with how your A plus uh, training goes as well. We'd love to hear about it. Yeah. Thank you so much and have a wonderful day, Professor. Thank you, Henry. Take care. One of the things that uh, that I was just mentioning is that uh, I try to keep track of technology. So if you're taking your A plus certification, and by the way, there's a lot of people in the queue for calls, and I will get with you as soon as I can with that piece. But Henry brought up uh, an, an um, information that kind of got me thinking. One of the projects that I'm doing this summer is that uh, um, my kids are out of school. We, have, we just have a lot of time now in the summer. Uh, one of my sons is really interested in technology, which I think is great. Um, he, I think he's really more interested in gaming. 
which I actually kind of think is great as well. So there's there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But he would like to have a computer that's more powerful. If there's one thing that's true with gaming computers is there's never one that's powerful enough. You always need the better motherboard, the additional memory, the SSD, et cetera, et cetera. And so as I'm looking at the A plus requirements, a lot of times we're trying to learn these concepts and it's in such a bubble that we don't understand how these concepts apply. So Henry was just mentioning about CPU technologies, uh, motherboard chipsets, uh, understanding what type of memory and the statistics on memory. We talk about uh, the CAS values, the CAS values on, on memory. Well, why does that even apply and how would I do that? So one of the things that uh, myself and, and my sons are going to be doing this summer is creating a gaming computer. And we're going to document this. We're going to put it on the Professor Messer YouTube channel and do a lot of things with it. And the place that we're going to do all of this is we've gone out to PCPartPicker.com. PCPartPicker.com. And uh, it's a great website because it lists out uh, CPUs, motherboards, memory, storage, video cards, power supplies, cooling systems, uh, other accessories, uh, monitors, operating systems. The whole thing is in there. And then I'm going to I'm going to buy it, and he's going to put it together. We're going to put it together together. It's going to be kind of like working on a, a car, except we're going to be working on a computer together, and we're going to be documenting this. Uh, so I want him to have the experience of putting it together to really, what do you use? Where do you put the standoffs? What type of case do you get? But then you also have to put that A-plus piece into it. Now, let me give you an example of this. This is the PC Part Picker website. And I was going through and just trying to do this because I created a build here uh, where I wanted a particular CPU. So I click on CPU. Well, which one do you get? There's so many CPUs. This is just the Intels that I pulled up. Uh, but you've got a choice of speeds, of cores, of the amount of, mem of amount of power required for these CPUs, performance information. There's even ratings that people put on the CPUs. So if you can sort by ratings, for instance, and see what the top rating is, it's an Intel Core i7 4770K, which I think is actually the one we're going to be getting for this particular build. Um, and you can see where uh, what the prices are for these CPUs out there. So this is, yep, and then the chat room's like, oh, yeah, getting an i7. Oh, yes, we're going to get an i7 for this, absolutely. Uh, but then what, what, when you choose that i7, you may want to see what motherboard would go with it. And, you know, if you ever look and try to do this yourself, you have to go through documentation of the motherboard. Does it support this? Well, on the PC Part Picker website, it's already done this for you. So it will show you, you see, a compatibility filter is on. It will only show you motherboards that that apply towards that particular CPU that you've selected. So I think in our particular case, we're going to go with um, one of the the latest Intel um, motherboard chipsets, which is a, a Z97, and and have a look at that. Uh, that is where you have to now start figuring out how much do I spend on this. But I'm going to, for instance, go down to uh, we're going to go down this Asus. Which one did I choose for this? It was the, uh, I'll just click on it. I've got it up here in my list. It's the Asus. I just picked this one out of here because it happened to have the wireless on it and shows you pictures of the motherboard. Ooh, like the pictures. But more importantly, here's where this applies back. So this takes uh, the memory slots, has four memory slots of 240 pin DIMMs. Uh -huh. So this goes back to what we were learning with memory, with their A+. It uses DDR3 memory, and it supports these speeds of memory. It supports all... I don't. I can't even afford the speeds, the higher speeds of DDR3 that this motherboard supports. So that's when I know I've got... Yes, in the chat room, everybody's putting, oh, yeah, that's going to cost you. They're putting the dollar signs up to do, to do that piece. Hold on just a moment. I've now, I've now created a problem for myself. Where now I can't uh, I can't talk because you've made me laugh. I may have mentioned earlier I'm recovering from uh, from that cold, so you guys are cracking me up. So this is where you can go through. This motherboard supports a maximum memory of 32 gig. Here's an important thing. Again, we're getting now into the storage. It supports. A uh, SATA of 6 gigabit per second, 6 SATA, 6 gig ports. Also has SATA Express port on it, some onboard Ethernet. It supports USB 3.0. So if you've gone through all of those different settings 
then you know, okay, USB 3.0, that's what I want. It's faster than the 2.0, and I may want to connect some other pieces. There's some some really a lot of fun you can have with this going through the different configurations. Another good example is memory. This will be the last one I choose for you because they show you the type of memory that's here. My compatibility filter is on, so you saw that it got rid of everything that didn't apply. If I turn off the compatibility filter, you can see it's even showing me 204-pin SODEMs. Well, wait, that's for a laptop. I don't need that. Well, of course I don't. Let's turn on my compatibility filter, and it gets rid of everything that doesn't apply. Everything is a 240-pin DIMM. Here's my cast values. So now I can even sort by that if I'm really looking for some very efficient memory, the fastest possible memory possible. Maybe, maybe I don't need that. Maybe price is my concern. Let's sort by price. Maybe the number, the amount of memory. So you can even scroll down and say, I want 16 gig in, we want that in two 8 gig modules. I can choose that. It's going to filter out all of those pieces and show me the 16 gig uh, that's in two 8 gig modules and see what the prices are. Just so much fun you can have with that. So much fun that you can go through. I spent hours last night building out different configurations and wondering which chipset should I use and what type of memory would go with that. Oh, we got to find SSDs. Um, and if you've ever done this and you're trying to figure out what SSD is going to be best, what type of memory is best, what type of case should I get? Uh, good sources for that are things like Tom's Hardware. You Google Tom's Hardware, which I think is tomshardware.com, um, and you'll be able to, to go through many, many different hardware oriented. So if you're somebody who's interested in doing that, that may be a really good place to go. Well, we've got some other people on hold. So uh, enough of, of my talking. I've got other questions for the people on hold as well. So we're going to go to that piece. We'll take one more call. And I have some other things to ask of you as well with those pieces. So I'm going to pull up a new question to have available. And we're going to go to the next person who's been holding forever. Uh, you're so patient in the 404 area code. Are you there, caller? Yes. Hi, what's your name? Clark. Hello, Mark. Thanks for calling in today. Are you uh, ready to answer a question? No, my name is Clark. Oh, I'm sorry. Clark. Did I get it wrong? Yeah. What was the name? Clark. I'm sorry. Clark. Like Clark Kent. Clark. Very good. Yeah. Even better. Thank you for correcting me. Uh, so, are you ready to answer right. a question from me uh, before you uh, ask? I'll try. Yeah. Okay, good. So, sure. here's one that I've got. This is uh, people hate printer questions. So, of course, I've got you a printer yes, question. I hate it. Okay, good. This is perfect. <laughs> here's my printer question for you. You are printing to a network laser printer, but you notice as you're selecting this in your Windows front end that the paper tray that has the company letterhead that's plugged into this printer isn't on your printer options. You don't even have the choice of choosing that particular paper tray. So what would be the most likely cause of this? Would that be because the printer tray is out of letterhead paper? Maybe you didn't even realize it was out of paper. Or is it that the printer is not currently powered on? That would certainly be an issue, but I don't know if that's what's causing this problem. Is it that the printer driver that you have is for a different printer model? Or is it because the paper tray has been physically removed from that slot on the printer? Do you have any idea of which one of those would apply in this particular case? Probably the fourth one. The, I think the paper tray has been removed. Paper tray's been removed from the slot. So I'm going to have some folks also that are listening in. I'll <laughs> pop up the QR code so they can see that as well. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't have that up first. So this is, um, whenever I get my questions in um, for the month, uh, people want more and more and more printer questions. And I think it's probably a good idea. There's a huge section on the A-plus exam that's on printers, and it's on laser printers, it's on uh, dot matrix uh, printers, it's on inkjet printers. And the problem, or I think the biggest problem people have is the integration of the operating system to the printer itself. And so I think this is a good question that applies towards that, which is that uh, you're looking at something in the operating system that doesn't match what's going on on the printer right now. So we somehow have mm -hmm. to correlate those things together. We've got 16 responses. So let's pull up and see what the responses are. When the uh, the folks have voted and say, one person said the printer tray is out of letterhead paper. Six people agree with you, Clark, that say the printer tray mm -hmm. has been removed from the slot. However, 14 people, I think, have voted so far, and I think they're right, which is the printer driver is for a different printer model, which in this particular really? case is the okay. case. And here's why. And this, this is, I think, is an important thing to consider when you're looking at printers. Okay. 
is that the printer driver that you're looking at, the Windows front end to the printer, um, has very little to do with the physical functional makeup of the actual printer somewhere down the line. Uh, all you're able to see uh, from your human being on Windows is what the printer driver is telling you. So if the printer driver isn't showing something, then the printer driver isn't is, is either incorrect or it's not the right printer driver. If you were to remove a paper from a slot, if you were to remove the cartridge, if you were to run out of paper, if the printer was not turned on, that wouldn't change what you saw in Windows. So if anything ever looks weird uh, or out of, out of sync with what you're seeing with a printer in your Windows front end, it is almost always going to be printer driver related. So maybe that will help you when you're ready to, to okay, take yeah. the exam with printer questions. So, uh, oh, do you have a qu you so question for me today? Yeah, I have two questions, and that's it. And I love your show. I love your um, your. I've learned a lot from you. Uh, um, been learning from any other sources. Great. Uh, not to brag for you, but yeah, you have the most. Um, you have the most uh, information that there is in, in the exam. I'm taking the exam in two forty-five Eastern time, actually. So oh. I'm, I, that's why I was in like two hours. Oh, come on, get the call in. Yeah. Two okay. Hours. I, know. I have two questions for you. Okay. Um, in in the A plus test, I think they're gonna do a simulation. Um, my friend told me that there's. Uh, he didn't tell me the answer, but it's just for me to figure out. Okay. Don't don't give us um, specifics, but yes, they do. Uh, they do talk. Uh -huh. uh, they do have what they call performance-based questions on the exam, which don't necessarily yeah. mean yeah. simulations. So this is an important thing to, to yeah. keep in mind. Doesn't mean that you'll be at a command line necessarily. In fact, on the 801 no, exam, no, yeah. there's. Are you taking your 801 or you're taking your 802? 801. 801. Okay. So the 801 doesn't even yeah. have command line in the exam objectives. So what you may get are matching. You may get fill in the blanks or you may get put things in order, that kind of thing. Yeah, that, that put things in order. <laughs> yeah. That's the one. <laughs> and you can think in the 801, yeah. there's probably a lot of good examples for that. I think I did a sample question on my daily pop quiz, which showed um, the types of, I think it was the type of interfaces like Ethernet, Gigabit, uh, uh, USB mm -hmm. 3.0, uh, uh, mm -hmm. and, and um, DisplayPort, uh, Firewire, and said put them in order from slowest to fastest. That's the type of thing you can think about mm. seeing on the exam, absolutely. Okay. It's hard to study right. for those because there's not a lot of good examples yeah. for that. You kind of have to think about it yourself and figure out what they might ask. Yeah. But if you know the content you should be able to apply it back to the performance-based questions. Okay. One of the things I've also heard um, that is, I think, important to consider, somebody was saying in the chat room that they took their 801, and they used to have, and, and you may still find this, all the performance-based questions were at the beginning of the exam. And one of the recommendations was skip over all of them, go directly to the multiple choice questions, finish those, and, then, and the multiple yeah. choice questions might help jog your memory for the performance base. But somebody in the chat room said, I got my performance based questions interlaced now within the multiple choices. So I think they may be switching some things up on the exam. You should be ready for yeah. anything, really. Mm-hmm. So is there a particular concern okay. or, or question about the performance-based questions you have or anything else about the exam yeah, that you're about to just, take? The only thing is, it's also, it's not only the, the performance-based exam, but also in, in practical as well. Like, for example, if you're going to build a, a uh, graphics computer, like, for example, a CAD, and then a gaming, and uh, which processor, the most... Um, mm processor would you use on each if you only have to choose two this is put a processor this is one of those things that uh, it's a new topic that's on the a plus exam which is building systems for particular functions and there's a list of uh -huh. those in the exam objectives um i'm trying to find exactly the section for that so i can put together what those things would be it would be designing custom computer systems section 1.9 on the exam oh, objectives. Nine, yeah. Yeah. Those two types of systems, by the way, uh, uh, um, the the CAD system, the con computer aided design, um, and the gaming system, very similar to each other. I would think gaming system is yeah. probably the higher end of those two, but both have certain requirements okay. to it. Um, the 
The computer right. aided design, for instance, is one that requires um, a lot of a, a big processor primarily, and it does need to have high end video. So it's kind of I yeah. would think if you got a choice between those two things, or you're trying to figure out which is faster. Um, the processor in both of those is going to be pretty comparable. One of the things that I found on the A plus exam is they don't give you a lot of questions where there's going to be a, a, a decision point that's so vague. Usually the decision points are very specific about what you're doing. So don't worry that they're going to put you in a situation where you're going to have to decide what, what kind of processor do I pick? If I have to pick between a CAD cam and uh, something like a gaming, I don't think you'll be put in that position. I think instead you'll be asked another question about something like uh, a a media center and a um, and a and a lower end uh, computer like a thin client, for instance, like one of these. I think that's the cases that you'll probably get a more wider perspective on. Uh, and I'm guessing with that, I don't know for sure, but I would uh, generally speaking, the questions on the A plus exam are very specific. With those things, well, I'll let you know after I take the test today. Then I'll email you. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, the, you can tell me. Was it vague or not? Were these questions on the money yeah. or not? Did you? Uh, um, yeah. So, uh, have you gone through the exam objectives and used that as a as a checklist? Actually, that's what I did. I did a checklist actually of everything I need to know. Um, the only thing, the only thing to uh, the next question I have is. If I am going to, um, it's about networking, so basic networking. Okay. Um, I'm I'm gonna ask about the channels. Like for example, I'm gonna I'm gonna um, um, put a network on my own, but I'm gonna put it within a network. So, um, is there any differences with the channel that I'm gonna use because it's in the same network? Give me a, an example of something you might configure this way. Okay, for example, I'm, in the, I'm at my house, and I, I have a different router upstairs. This is just an example. It's not sure. realistic. Okay. I have a router upstairs, and then there's another router upstairs for my guest, just for example. Okay. And my guest router, for example, they're both open. Right. And they have, they're on the same network. Okay. Does the channel make a difference? Like, do I put like, okay, what channel? Channel one or three or five? Does, does that make a difference? Your your wireless channels that you're using, is yeah. specifically what you're referring to, the wireless frequencies that are in use. And in fact, they do. They're 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 remarkably important. We go into a little bit of this okay. with the A plus exam. I'm going to pull up some of the wireless uh, standards that are on here because there is a section. I think it's two six that talks about uh, installing a wireless router specifically for Soho, but I think it applies across the board. Um, and on there is a section about wireless channels and wireless encryption. And I think there's some other settings, uh, some other uh, uh, configuration options available or, or topics available in the A-plus exam. But the channels are extremely important. I have the scenario you just mentioned. I have, in my house, I have three access points. Um, and it's important for the access points that you don't overlap channels uh, because if, yep. especially if the access points are close to each other, they will they will fight with each other. They will, they will have common mode overload. They will overload the frequency. When one is, is sending traffic, the other one can't receive very well because there's interference on that particular frequency. So it's remarkably important. Let's say with 802.11b is a good example of this. People always say use channel 1, channel 6, and channel 11 mm -hmm. because none of those three channels overlap with each other. And that's a similar scenario to what I've created in my house. One of my access points is on one of those. One is on 6. One is on, on 11. So I've separated them out on the B channels, for instance. I'm not using yep. B anymore, but I think that's a good example of, of what you have to keep in mind. Definitely stay away from frequencies that are going to conflict with each other. Yeah, yeah. Well, All right, well, I think that's it. Um, I think you answered my question, and um, I hope I pass the test. <laughs> I, I hope you do, too. Good luck with that. Let us know how it goes, yeah. Clark. All right, thank you so much. Take care. Have a good day. Well, that's, uh, that's exciting. He's going to have to leave soon to take... Uh, advantage of that it's, there are challenges of course uh, a lot of the newer access points will automatically figure out what's out there and set their channels to something that is is least 
uh, that has the least chance of creating interference. When you're in apartment buildings, it becomes exceptionally hard because everybody's got a wireless access point. Now our wireless, de our mobile devices do uh, do do uh, wireless as well, so we can can take information and share it between our laptops and other mobile devices. Uh, we've got such a challenge and so many only so many frequencies available. Um, so sometimes it's nice to be able to get a third-party app. There's a lot of free apps out there that you can run on your computer that will examine what's out there already. You can see what your neighbors are running and then manually perhaps even choose something different on your side. Yeah, it's another one of those things that, that becomes remarkably helpful. Now, if you are studying for your A-plus certification, uh, one of the things that I will uh, let you know is you've got a lot of study options available out there. Uh, one of them is related to the content that you have to know. I think that's one of the, the challenges is just being able to, to know everything that you need to know on the exam. There's so much content. You have to know all the speeds, all the feeds, all the pieces associated with it. And that's why I created, you've probably seen my study guides. So I have study guides that I've taken every slide of every, all the content from my certification videos, and I've put them onto a single study guide. So these are uh, really PDFs that I've created that have everything on them. Uh, for instance, uh, here is a good example of my 802 study guide that has on it all the things that you need to know for system requirements. This is the first page of it. Here's an overview of Windows 7 and the different options available. And we need if you need to upgrade Windows, here's the options available. Here's the command lines, every command line that you'll need to know for the A plus exam. So I tried to create these PDFs that would give you everything. So you could, of course, go through my videos and make these notes yourself, or you can Pay $10 to have these study guides. They're available to you in electronic form. You can download them immediately. And all of that goes, of course, back to support keeping the website running. And a lot of you have already gotten these study guides. I get great feedback from you, and I really do appreciate you being able to support those. It becomes exceptionally helpful uh, to take care of the hosting and the bandwidth. Uh, that's one of the great things is, is the popularity of the website also increases the bandwidth costs of the website. So we have to be able to manage those things out. So thanks so much for supporting the website and doing that. We've got uh, some other folks on the line. I want to go to another call. Thanks in the chat room also for reminding me with those pieces well as well. I think that's uh, useful to have those people in the back of my head there. Let's go to the 559 area code. Are you there, caller? Hello? Hello, caller. I hear I hear you and some other little tiny people in the background. Yeah, that is uh, that is my kids. That's excellent. What's hey, your this name? Is I'm sorry. What's your name? This is Jana Penguin. Oh, hey. Oh, gay. Yeah, good to see you. Thanks for uh, for calling in. So, what? I have a question for you first. Before you ask a question, are you ready for it? Sure. Okay. Here we go. So. Three years since I took plus. So. Well, good. So this this should be old hat at this point. Let's hope, because I went through these questions myself and thought, I don't know if I remember the answer to these. Here's the, the question anyway, is specifically related to, it's a networking question. So this might, this might be, oh, so sort of a networking question. I think it falls into what we're doing. Which of these technologies is commonly used for printing and uses a direct line of sight for communication? So already this is a wireless question for printing. Uh, the options are infrared, Bluetooth, 802.11, and mobile broadband. And remember, no answering in the chat room. So which of these technologies can be used for printing with a direct line and require a direct line of sight? Infrared, Bluetooth, 802.11, or mobile broadband? Do you have any ideas of what that might be? Yeah, it's going to be infrared. That's going to be infrared. And I think that's probably a good choice. And you can almost do a uh, break it down into a different set of things. There's Bluetooth, of course, is not line of sight. You could be walking around and Bluetooth works fine. 802.11, certainly not line of sight. None of us would be using it if, if it had required line of sight to the access point. And mobile broadband, of course, is not going to be. That's, that's everywhere. You certainly don't need a line of sight to the mobile broadband antennas outside of your house to be able to do that piece. So you were right on the money with that one. Folks are, are agree with you by far the number of voters so far definitely infrared is down that line. So, well thanks for calling. You have a question for me today. Um 
Yeah, I, I actually, I want to say more of a thank you. Uh, three years ago when I um, visited your site to study for the 701 and 702. Have I been doing this uh, that long? Yeah. I guess I have, yes. Well, <laughs> um, yeah, I've, I've, uh, more, uh, more of a statement to anybody that's listening. Um, the best way of learning, I mean, go through all your books and your videos, but get hands-on experience. So I felt like I learned more to actually going and doing anything that was uh, the uh, uh, content that was in the books and, you know, actually applying it. I agree. Um, a lot of people even say get a old computer and rip it apart, take it completely apart, and then put it back together and see if it works when you do all those things. I think also uh, command line information is good as well. Um, in my videos, I go through and do a lot of command lines, and I do them in a way that you could repeat it on your computer if you wanted to. I think the hands-on, not only for the 801, very hardware-specific, especially if you haven't worked with hardware. Could, could you imagine jumping into the A-plus exam? And a lot of people do this. They've never touched a computer. How hard that must be. And I think getting the hands-on piece could be really, really important to learning what SATA is because you actually touch it. How did... Yeah, yeah the, 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 the way I did it yeah. was when I was in uh, taking the A-plus, I was in college. And uh, I was going through the Cisco Network Academy. And my instructor, I, I don't know why, but I guess he knew where I was studying the A-plus. That he, um, anytime he had a computer, he had to fix. He always gave it to me. Okay. So you know, I, I you know, think about formatting and partitioning disk and uh, uh, swapping out hard drives. You know, um, anything with the, uh, you know. So that was what helped me a lot with uh, taking the A plus was because I kind of thank him because he always gave me computers to work on. One of the things that I have uh, often see, um, uh, I read uh, the Reddit uh, subreddits a lot for uh, IT, for people uh, doing computer repair. And a lot of the times people are saying, I got this job, but I really am not comfortable with a lot of the things they're throwing at me. I've never done these things before. I feel like I'm an imposter. I've kind of <laughs> snuck in behind the, the lines. And I almost want to write back and say, we all feel this way because you can't know every possible thing that there is to know about PCs. You can't possibly know every possible thing there is to know about networking, about security, about databases, about operating systems. You're constantly going to be learning. And very often it is a trial by fire. You're given a task. Now I have to figure out how to make this task work. You almost have to be as good at Googling as you are at actually performing the task. If, if, if we didn't have Google, I'd be out of the job. I, I, I remember the days back in the day where there was no Google and there was a time when this was true. And you used other mm -hmm. resources. You used bulletin boards. There was a lot more emphasis in books. We used to have a lot of people still do have enormous bookshelves, but that was our primary source of content. And you had to create an enormous library because if you didn't have that library and you ran across a problem with your network, where were you going to go to get more information? And you collected a bunch of people that you knew and you kept them on speed dial. That was what we did. Google's changed oh, yeah. everything. Yeah, I am. Um, uh, at work, I, I'm always, um, there are, we're doing a lot of stuff with the cloud. So yep. every every day, hey, we, we want to do our all our backups to the cloud and we want the cheapest solution. So you have to wow. do research and learn okay. different products and learning something new you know, every day. That's that's remarkable. I, I'm I'm finding the same thing with the things that I do during the day. There's a lot more cloud based. There's a ton more virtualization. Virtualization, we thought, oh, we got it now. We're done virtualized. Virtualization is not anywhere near done yet. Software defined networks oh, has have... changed everything. So we're still trying to keep up and figure out those pieces. I'm still learning concepts and ideas about those things. Trying to get hands on, and I think that's that's all. That's what you ultimately have to do is get the hands on and, and start working with it. Well, uh, thank you for taking the time to talk to me, and um, uh, have a good day. Thanks for calling. Take care. And if you are someone who is your A-plus certification and you would like to get continuing education units for watching this particular live event or you're watching it on replay, you can send me an email directly. Go to the Professor Messer website. There's a Contact Us link right at the top and send me a note uh, that says, I watched your May 2014 study group. The secret code word for that CE credit is 
hands on. And that way I'll be able to send you an email that certifies that you did indeed watch this particular video live or watch this particular video after the fact. That's uh, one of those useful things if you're collecting those continuing education units. There is, uh, uh, we are at the top of the hour. We have gone through an hour of this particular study group and I feel like I haven't been able to do much at all. I still have some people on the line. I like to end this up in an hour. So if you're watching for credit, that you'll have your one hour there. But we've got a lot of people still on the phone. If you're there, please stay there. We're going to do an after show. And in the after show, we'll just keep doing this. Why not? We've got you on the phone. I've got another 60 minutes on that after show to be able to do that. But if you are uh, someone who is is following us and keeping track of what we're doing here at Messer Studios, then you know you can always watch what we're doing on Twitter and on on YouTube by going to professormesser.com slash Twitter, professormesser.com slash YouTube. You want to figure out where I am, go to professormesser.com slash the name of that social networking. I wonder if I have an Instagram one up. I really should. Um, uh, and and I, and somebody even said, you should do a Snapchat. I'm thinking that, that might be a really bad idea. Uh, but maybe I'll do one. You can find out. Go to professormesser.com slash something. You'll find me. If you want to know more about those study guides, you can go to professormesser.com slash A plus S G, A P L U S S G, to learn more about those study guides. GTS Learning always helps us sponsor this. They have books. They have uh, they have uh, sample tests that you can take. They have online materials. They have sample labs that you could take and study for your A plus certification all in virtual labs and be ready for those simulation and performance based questions. You can find that information at professormesser.com slash freestyle labs. And of course, we do this study group every month. You can learn more about that at professormesser.com slash calendar and keep up with those pieces as well. And that's that brings us to the end of that one hour of the A-plus study group. I appreciate everyone coming to the, the live event that we have. Thanks for sending me your questions. I could not do it without your support. We'll see you next time on the A-plus study group.